All right. And next up, we have uh, Tony Beasley, who's the director of NRAO, who's going to talk about the NGVLA, the next step. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to add my thanks to uh, those given by Phil and previous speakers to our local hosts. And thanks to all of you here and, and people on Zoom uh, for attending the meeting. I hope we have a great conference ahead of us. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the, how do I point it? Oh, there we go, is the next generation very large array. So um, you're familiar at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in the US. Uh, we operate a handful of telescopes around the world, the, the Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico, the Very Long Baseline Array distributed across the United States, uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. Eventually, we realized that pointing all the antennas in the same direction was very important. Uh, <laughs> Alma has leapt forward since then. Um, and our sister observatory, the, the Robert C. Bird Green Bank Telescope in, in West Virginia. Uh, and this is the business we have chosen. I think we are all here because we're interested in this sky, uh, the radio sources that we see in them. It looks like the night sky, but of course everything in there is a galaxy, pretty much, and you can see our galaxy running bottom left to top right there. So, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here and some of the, the wonderful videos that Phil showed are about our developing tools and techniques and so on to explore this universe. Um, a little bit of radio history here. If you go back to the 1990s when Phil and I were young and beautiful, um, the, the VLA was online, the Very Long Baseline Array came on, and there was a discussion of a square kilometer array, which in its earliest uh, incantation was kind of an H1 machine, it was a low frequency telescope. Uh, maybe a decade later, uh, that split into SKA low and mid, and there was an SKA high defined at that time, a 3 to 30 gigahertz SKA. Um, that was kind of put on ice pretty quickly, and there was more focus on low and mid, and then today we see the incredible progress towards that uh, SKA low and mid. Now NRAO's interests during this time were initially millimeter, and so ALMA came out of that. But in the centimeter there was you know, a strong desire for more frequency coverage, more resolution, more sensitivity, and a sense of you know, eventually once the VLBA came online, that actually merging them into a single instrument would be good. And so there were proposals, there was the expanded very large array proposal phase one, which eventually upgraded the VLA to the Jansky VLA. And there was a phase two proposal then to actually build more antennas around New Mexico. Let's go back. Um, ultimately, uh, in 2010, of the Decadal Survey, there was a North American array proposed. Uh, that, that was uh, you know, pretty similar to NGVLA in many respects. So the remarkable thing is that there's actually quite a, a history here. There's a straight line between SKA high, as thought about 20 years ago, and where we are with NGVLA today. So what were the goals of NGVLA? Really to build an instrument which has 10 times the sensitivity and resolution of the existing VLA in ALMA, uh, a broader frequency range, one to 116 gigahertz. To do that requires a lot of antennas on the ground. And the scientific goal, kind of the, the catchphrase, was thermal imaging on milli arc second scales. And I'll describe that in a minute. <clears throat> uh, the technical baseline here to, to achieve NGVLA there's 244 antennas, uh, 80 meter diameter, the core of 114, um, spiral out to 54, roughly about 190 antennas within the current footprint of the existing VLA. And then a remaining 70 antennas distributed out on various scales throughout the United States. There's also a short baseline array um, to provide uh, low surface brightness sensitivity. We have bands one through six as well, imaginatively named, and a lot of our digital specs are there, you know, 20 gigahertz per polarization is kind of the basic spec to pull back. In terms of configuration, you see here on the bottom left, uh, we have a core defined, which is about two kilometers away from the current core of the VLA. Um, that sort of maps out into a five arm spiral, which covers the current area of the VLA. That spiral, if you go to the top left, continues out through the desert southwest. And then at the top right, that merges in uh, on larger scales to the very long baseline array, which we also add antennas and sites to. The key science goals, and a lot of this will be discussed over the, over the week here, unveiling the formation of solar system analogues on terrestrial scales, uh, probing the initial conditions of systems for life with astrochemistry, charting the assembly structure and evolution of galaxies over time, 
pulsars uh, as tests of gravity and understanding black holes and uh, the evolution of multi-messenger astronomy. So, you know, this is a, kind of one of our uh, major uh, simulations. I don't have as many good simulations. Um, this is really uh, what we're seeking to do, which is to look at the evolution of the formation of planets on terrestrial scales around nearby stars. On the top left there, you can kind of see what ALMA can do. And as you look at this video, this is actually what we should be able to do on timescales of months or a few years with, with NGVLA. Uh, astrochemistry is very important. Uh, the GBT is probably the premier instrument for this at the moment. Uh, by the time you bring the angular resolution and the sensitivity of NGVLA to the situation, you can get down to this sort of bottom blue line here where you're actually starting to detect things like amino acids uh, in space, uh, simple sugars and so on. Uh, charting the assembly of galaxies, uh, in particular looking at the low CO lines redshifted in the early universe, we can use NGVLA to look at the, the mass function of, of uh, molecular clouds in galaxies at high redshift and really start to understand the gas dynamics, the dust dynamics of what's going on in these galaxies. We talked a little bit about pulsars. Um, there is, you know, rumored to be, there should be many pulsars at the galactic center. We don't seem to do a great job of finding them at the moment. With the sensitivity of NGVLA, we should be able to detect more of those and actually use the, the gravitational potential at the center of the galaxy as a, a test of, of Einstein's theories. And then lastly, uh, the evolution of uh, black holes in the era of multi-messenger astronomy. We are about to go through a revolution in terms of what data we have access to, our understanding of these objects and so on. And we've already seen with the detection of GW170817, our ability to really follow up on what LIGO, for example, is doing to explore the, the formation of these objects. Uh, another thing we've been doing recently, uh, this is a radar observation transmitting out a green bank and received with a VLBA antenna. Um, this is a, a new area of science for us. It was something we were pursuing, but has perhaps been brought into focus by the collapse of Arecibo. Um, it is remarkable what you can actually do. That's kind of zooming in there. Um, you know, this, is, uh, this diagram is probably about 30 or 40 kilometers across, and you can get down and see lava channels on the surface of the moon. And this is a 20-minute observation with two of our antennas. So there's a lot of work to be done here in the solar system and uh, looking for near-Earth objects and so on. So in the first 10 years, here's a simple list of what we will do. Mapping hundreds of protoplanetary disks, exploring their chemistry, looking at the formation of these early galaxies, these tests of uh, Einstein's theory and gravitational, um, in, in gravitational potential, uh, precision gravitational physics and this multi-messenger science and some of this exciting uh, solar system near-Earth object and, and actually additional observations for space situational awareness. Um, NGVLA went through the, the astronomy uh, decadal survey in 2020 and it was identified as a priority uh, for the next decade. It should be online in 2036. And so that's kind of the, the drumbeat we're, we're marching to. Um, we have a, a standard project. This is how NREO builds things. And so it's uh, defined in kind of the major research equipment uh, style that the NSF prefers. Uh, I am the project director at the moment. Um, we have our project managers, Bill and Mesterhaus and, and Will Ho uh, Bill Hodjanowski, who is, is actually here, and many members of the team are, are actually here. And so all of these different product teams, antennas, electronics, operations, broader impacts are all active. Uh, one of the key things in NGVLA is the antenna. Um, as, as Phil showed, some, some lovely diagrams. This is something, you know, antennas end up being about half the cost of a radio telescope in many situations. And so this is clearly something you have to do to kind of reduce the risk of your project. Uh, we were very fortunate to receive funding from the National Science Foundation to build a prototype antenna and went through its PDR last December. And so later this year, we will start, uh, I think we're already preparing the site. Um, the actual antenna will turn up at the VLA site in the middle of next year. And uh, we hope to be getting fringes with the VLA antennas uh, shortly after that. So this has been going very well. Um, and then there are other parts of technologies, for example, the, the panels on the dishes, et cetera. And this is working with our German colleagues on that. There we go. Uh, Phil mentioned RFI, and this is clearly a serious issue. Um, we certainly support the efforts, the policy efforts, and a lot of the kind of government and other efforts to to explore this issue. We have taken a very direct approach on this. We've certainly thought about it in terms of the architecture of the instrument 
how do we deal with RFI, not just you know, SpaceX, et cetera, just to deal with all forms of it. Uh, and so there are lots of places in our signal chains where action can be taken to, to deal with this. So you know, uh, in terms of the design of the array, we're very aware of this. Um, in addition, uh, we actually, uh, we all talk about RFI. I don't know that we actually do a very good job of measuring it at our sites. Uh, we detect it in our telescopes sometimes, but broadly, the RFI properties of our radio astronomy sites are not really known, actually. So NREO is developing this all-sky monitor, um, essentially measuring the spectrum in a standard calibrated way from 1 to 116 gigahertz. Kind of looks like a Dalek, if you know what a Dalek is. Um, and so, you know, this is one thing we're going to be offering the community at some level, kind of a standardized approach to looking at RFI. In addition, we have been working with SpaceX. We've built a pilot site near our, uh, near our radio telescope to actually look and measure quantitatively the impacts of, uh, of uh, constellation transmission on the array. Uh, another thing we will be uh, testing later this year is actually a connection in real time between the real time systems of the VLA and SpaceX's systems. So we know which, where each other is and what we're doing and so on. So we can coordinate better with them in terms of uh, observing. Data management, um, you know, we, we operate uh, best in class telescopes already. And so we see the data management for NGVLA as being a big step, but a sensible step beyond what we already have. Uh, we have ALMA and VLA architectures, and we very much follow a science ready data products. So the, the researchers should be receiving very well cooked, very well calibrated images and, and, and cubes and so on, not being asked to do FFTs. And so this is, you know, ALMA is doing this already very successfully. I would say we expect a lot of reuse of, of our uh, infrastructure uh, towards NGVLA. Uh, but there is a, you know, we're talking about more data. As Phil pointed out, there are incredible data volume challenges here. And so one thing we have underway is sort of a next generation CASA effort, where instead of dealing with sort of data sets at our current level, we're dealing with kind of these petabyte and, uh, and so on problems that Phil mentioned. So we have that underway, not necessarily, you know, we certainly as part of NGVLA, but also because we will need this for the wideband sensitivity upgrade on ALMA, which has begun. And so this is sort of the thing that drives NRAO very well when we have the telescope coming and we need to get things done. So this is what um, a sort of normal development of a telescope in the US system looks like. I'm sort of leaping ahead too much. Um, what you can see here is that there's typically a development period, design, construction, operations, and divestment. Uh, right now, NGVLA is sort of at the start of the design period. Our different uh, product teams, our different deliverables are in different stages of design maturity. So we're kind of here now, just at the start of this uh, three, or three to five year process. Um, we hope to sort of be finished by about 2026. We are hoping for construction to start somewhere in 2027, back up on, on the main line, and to be online in 2037. Now, you know, this, these are the plans. Um, they, they rarely encounter, rarely survive encounter with the enemy. I mean, the US is about to drive into probably a difficult period for science funding for a couple of years. So things go later and they get more expensive and that's the way things evolve. But nonetheless, we are moving forward strongly. We've received a lot of great support from the community and the National Science Foundation. Now between 20, the start of construction and full science operations, there's a sense of transition. And so we have a VLA. We want to start using the NGVLA. How do we make that transition? So we've put together a, a transition team. Uh, this is uh, people from the community, not just in the US, from around the world as well, to really look at what are the options. I mean, there's some amazing science opportunities coming towards us with some of these other instruments coming online. And so this is a terrible time, a terrible decade to be offline. And so we have the VLA. What would we actually do to keep the VLA going to enable that science? Um, but uh, at the same time, get the job done. And that is a difficult problem. It sort of wraps in science, it wraps in human capital, wraps in a lot of things. So we are, have had that discussion with this committee. We're waiting for the first concepts document to come back, and we will see, you know, what does this transition period look like? What will be available to the community? We do have strong community support. On the left, we see many of the, the great uh, partners that we've had in the US community supporting NGVLA. Top right are some of our uh, industrial partners, and then on the right, we see some of our international colleagues. In terms of partnership, we've always assumed a 25% non-NSF contribution that can come from domestic sources or from international sources. 
We do have a lot of international involvement but, but with our science advisory and technical advisory committees, and we've run a community study program and so on. Uh, our Mexican partners are assigned at this point, and we're looking uh, to some of these other partners uh, for, for interest. We've had international development consortium meetings where we talk about interests and, and work packages and so on. That's been going very well. We are also talking to uh, other agencies in the US and other uh, interested parties about what some of the radar and space situational awareness interests might be. And so that requires the same sort of, exactly the same process. You have to develop interest and uh, uh, capture requirements and so on. So over the next 18 months, I think we will secure those partnership uh, contributions for design and construction. That's the plan. And we will continue to work the, uh, the, the, the overall plan and the work package distribution. Now, in parallel with that, NREO supports, and we're very happy to, supports a lot of great initiatives in the community at different scales. And so, oops. Uh, so if you look at things like HERA, VLIDE, DSA 2000, NGEHT, all of these instruments are incredibly important to our US community. They are also things that we can work very closely with and benefit from. And so, you know, we are very happy to, to kind of help our friends along here. And there are technology exchanges and people exchanges and all of that, it's, it's good. Uh, just a moment in terms of, you know, this, this open skies discussion. I mean, the facilities that NSF generates are incredibly important in terms of democratizing science in the United States. Anyone in the US from anywhere can write a proposal to the VLA. And so if you look at the, you know, sort of NREO statistics, over the course of the last 10 years, there's been nearly 4,000 proposers from 48 states, um, South Dakota and Mississippi, if you're wondering. Um, so... You know, this is a way that people in all kinds of walks of life in different locations can actually take part in the radio astronomy venture. But this is also a global scale here. I mean, part of the NGVLA creed, part of NREO's fiber is open skies, that we offer our facilities and the best ideas get on. and We don't care where they come from. And so when we think about this, uh, you know, this is the statistics of foreign proposers over the course of the last 10 years. And so it's nearly 5,000 people from 64 countries. And it's all good. This is the way that we see radio astronomy working. And so, you know, we've been very fortunate, I think, over some decades that our field has, has very much stood on a platform in some sense that the National Science Foundation provided to all of us. NSF has always supported open skies. And so we're very happy to continue that with NGVLA moving forward. Um, in addition to the straight science, you know, we have other, other broader impacts uh, to consider. One of the things that we're going to do probably in all scenarios here is build a next generation learning and education center at the very large array. Um, the VLA is a very impressive thing and we have a very small visitor center for it right now. And so the idea of expanding that and making this somewhere where you can really stand, learn about radio astronomy and so on uh, and watch NGVLA be built is important. Um, this is just kind of a shot from the inside. You can see in the middle there, we have a Joe McMullen actually giving the tour um, we have a fridge full of John McMullins left at NREO, and so we, de we deploy them wherever we can. Uh, so just in terms of status, uh, I'm hoping to have a major announcement in the coming weeks. I think NSF is going to formally put us into the, the next block in that diagram I showed you. Uh, later this year, we'll have a cost review. Um, we've been very fortunate. The design of the array and, in some sense, our estimates and all that have been pretty, pretty steady since we uh, first pitched the detailed design back in 2019. What has changed, as Phil pointed out, is the economic conditions. The later you go, the, the higher it costs. And so we will uh, probably update the package with respect to that later this year. Um, we are hoping to announce a design funding, uh, three-year design funding uh, opportunity with the NSF that we'll be, we'll be picking up. Uh, we will continue to work on the partnership definition and have that all done in time for PDR, we hope. Those designs will come along in 24, probably should be 25 and 27. And really everything I'm talking about here has been made possible by strong NSF support. To date, the NSF has invested more than $50 million in NGVLA. And so we are, you know, we're very appreciative of the support from the community that then enables the NSF to invest. So this week is about science. And we're not here to compare, we're here to combine. Uh, and really, I think the thing that uh, we can think about is if we had these flagship uh, opportunities, you know, these amazing instruments available, SKA and NGVLA and ALMA at the different frequencies, what can we do with those instruments? And I think that's the question to, to all of you uh, over the course of the next week. There is a future to that. I mean, we can actually imagine 
on longer time scales at low and medium and high frequencies, um, you know, northern and southern capabilities. So a next generation, you know, so a new version of LOFA and NGVLA and NOEMA. In the south, you have SKA and ALMA. Again, what can we do with those facilities? And that's the, the challenge to the community to really think about that. Um, and so just finally, I would say, um, there are a lot of challenges ahead for NGVLA. Um, we've been very fortunate to receive a lot of support from the National Science Foundation and so on. Um, you know, there, there are hurdles to clear. Um, there's the state of the country to think about, all these things. But uh, in general, the strength of NGVLA has always been the people that built this array that can operate in these conditions. And so, you know, I'm very fortunate to be part of that team. And I will say that uh, the plan is very good. We have very good support from our science community. We have strong interest from our partners and we are thundering down this track. Thank you. Gobs. That's great. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions for Tony? Uh, right there, pod shirt. <laughs> yep, that's right. Hi, thanks for a great talk. So, this is Michael speaking from Borum. I was just wondering oh, first, thanks for announcing uh, NGVLA being open sky, but will this decision be influenced by SKO's decision to be not fully open sky, or is this is now set. It's they're not coupled these decisions. No. Uh, Gregory Sivakov, University of Alberta. One of the challenges uh, that a lot of ground based facilities are seeing are seeing are the uh, increasing environmental reviews that have to be done to build and the NGVLA will be very uh, spread out geographically. So how is that combination of things uh, being taken account of at the uh, planning level. Sure. Um, so, you know, that is a concern, um, you know, not just in the US, but around the world, the level of environmental review and the sort of the discussion is much more broad than it used to be. Uh, I think we have um, two advantages. So one advantage is, you know, we are already on the site where, you know, four fifths of the antennas are going. So that, that helps. That is not perfect. It still means there's a responsibility and work to be done there. And then, you know, conceptually, um, the other point that maybe pins us is that uh, the, the existing VLBA sites are kind of where we want to base some of the long baseline activities. That is good, but not absolutely required. And then as you think about moving out from the spiral and so on, I mean, in reality, um, you know, understanding our process, the, the sort of error on where the antenna can be is like 10% of the distance from the core, right? So if you're 300 kilometers away from the core, the antenna can be anywhere within 30 kilometers or something like that and not significantly impact things. And so I think that's kind of a huge advantage is that as we look at the uh, intermediate sites, we're simply probably uh, largely gonna buy commercial land. Um, you know, the, the optimum for us is sort of a nice piece of land with a fiber running past and a power line 15 kilometers outside a relatively small town or something like that. And so I think that's the advantage as we look at these greenfield sites at NGVLA requires, we have a lot of flexibility to not cause ourselves the kind of environmental concerns that can come. And that, that actually generates an interesting, um, it, it's sort of the opposite of the way we have traditionally walked up to this, which is we tend to think that federal land is good because the government owns it and the government's probably in favor of a government project, but then that brings all of the environmental review with it. So there's a middle ground to be found there in terms of where we deploy. We are anchored at a few points but we are not anchored in a lot of points, and those are the places where we'll use that flexibility. I was wondering if you could comment on the long baseline array and how that fits in with the future of the VLBA. Is the thinking that the long baselines for NGVLA will replace the VLBA capabilities, or will they sort of uh, become partner? Um, institutions. So that is part of the transition planning that the, the group is actually doing. Um, the, the VLBA actually is part of the mission operations of the United States. The VLBA provides key data for calibrating GPS. And so in some sense, the VLBA absolutely has to be online until an alternative is perfectly online. 
And so the VLBA, you know, in some situations, the VLBA is probably the last part of NGVLA to be implemented. Um, there are three antennas at each of these long baseline sites. The existing VLBA antenna that's there will be there quite late in the process, I would imagine. So the, there is a transition between VLBA and NGVLA, but it probably comes very late to ensure that the, uh, the data are being produced for the, for the DOD. Question? Uh, so, uh, 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 so how large is the expected uh, data size provided from the uh, data processor of the NGVLA and how do you manage, let's say, let's say maybe the excess scale? Data. Yeah, I actually haven't got those numbers on me. Uh, sorry, uh, typically a four hour observation is 100 terabytes or something like that. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Um, I have a question about the transition between the VLA and the NGVLA. Um, do you mind commenting a bit more? Should we, you know, stop the VLA and then put efforts on the NGVLA, or how how do you think that's going to happen? Yeah, um, I mean the the process is that we, you know, we've put this uh, committee together that will look at this problem and think about what the science opportunities are. But it, you know, it's a multi-dimensional problem. So um, if I pulled my project manager hat on, I would say the moment the first dollar for NGVLA comes in the door, you shut the VLA down and all those people are now building NGVLA. That generates quite a gap in observing time. And so it's not perhaps the best solution in that sense, right? The uh, next solution is you run the VLA at full steam all the way up until there's a VLA of collecting area on NGVLA and then all those people move over. So that means you've got two teams. And as I think we all know in the community, there aren't two teams. Um, there's one team. Uh, most organizations are struggling to, to find the people that they need. And so that's absolutely the worst in terms of human capital and implementation and so on. So uh, you can define the ends of the spectrum. And I think what we're trying to do is find a reasonable plan in between. And, and the, the plan can't be brittle. It can't be an amazing plan that everyone agreed to that gets totally talked by the government doing something or a pandemic, for example. It has to be a very flexible kind of approach. I mean, generally speaking, viewed from space, we kind of know what we're talking about here, which is we want to keep the VLA going as long as possible, uh, give, uh, but, but provide the ability for NGVLA to grow, which sort of means keeping the VLA online, but trying to get the detailed manpower requirement to operate it down. And so I think we then naively associate that with you know, less receivers, less configurations and all that. There are sort of simple answers. It turns out none of those are simple answers. And so that's the process that this committee is in. Eric and, and Trish Henning up the back there, um, are sort of the NREO context to that. There are members of this committee, Joe Lazio, hand up, uh, is, part, is one of the co-chairs on that committee. So it's a difficult problem, but I think we, we absolutely see that the science opportunity is amazing. And I, I can tell you the cost of doing that, you know, it's like five years of running the VLA. So it's like $75 million. So does $75 million make a decision in a $2,800 million project? The answer is not exact, it's not clear. So it, it is a tricky problem. If you have opinions, please go and hassle Joe. Um, any time of the day or night is fine. Um, <laughs> Kind of related to that, is there a plan for what to do with the current VLA dishes as uh, NGVLA comes online? You've got an idea? <laughs> I mean, there might be countries that might be uh, interested in moving have them ever, to their have country. Have you ever heard the saying that astronomers can't add, engineers can't subtract, and indirects only multiply? Um, <laughs> so it would be scope creep. It would be a new project to do something with the VLA. Oh, yeah, I'm not saying NRAO should yeah. run it, but there might be some other agency in some other country that might Maybe. be willing to take it on. Uh, some other country, no. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it, is, it is possible. But then, of course, a lot of that in, in rail infrastructure, for example, has to be removed now. And so, yeah, uh, there are, I, I don't think there's been a lot of thought about that. 
In general, of course, um, you know, the amazing NREO team here does a, a, an amazing job of, of keeping it going. But that hardware is 40 years old and, you know, we kind of see the other end of the bathtub curve and so on. So that gets harder as time goes on. And that is, again, part of the discussion about what the transition plan should be. Yeah, there may also be wealthy astronomy enthusiasts that would pay to buy one of those dishes. So we just like sell two to Elon and three to Jeff Bezos and yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> up the back, yeah. There's one up the back. Right Hi, uh, Ned Moulter at UC Berkeley. Thanks for a really nice talk. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about NG CASA and what is needed on the software side to support NGVLA? Sure, so you know, a, a big part of the issue uh, is that uh, we're talking about larger data volumes moving through. And so th this is a problem that I, NREO has been walking towards for the last several years, in part in response to the wideband sensitivity upgrade of ALMA. We just know that uh, we have an existing system, it's very effective in many ways, but it's not clear that the current architecture is going to allow us to shove 10 times more data through it and so on. So uh, a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, pre so it's more than a few, um, we built a, a demonstrator, uh, sort of a prototype of a, of a next generation version of CASA that was using uh, you know, a more modern set of tools and so on. And that was very successful. And in fact, we had a number of great collaborations with our SKA colleagues in terms of data model formats and, and all of that, because we are facing a lot of the same kinds of problems in, in some sense. And so um, what we are now doing is that we are really moving out on the wideband sensitivity upgrade of ALMA now. You know, we've funded the correlator contract, this is coming. And so that is where, um, that is what focuses us. So we now know we need a larger solution. And so that effort on NG CASA is going to, to ramp up. We recently hired a new uh, software architect uh, moving into Albu in Albuquerque already. Um, and so if you're interested, uh, please talk to Jeff Kern at NREO. And you know, this is an effort we're going to ramp up over the next few years. I, I think the difficulty is to try and create something. I mean, we are very focused to create things that reduce, that, that meet our needs. Along the way, obviously, serving the broader community is very important, but not reproducing some of the, uh, the problems that, uh, our, as a community, we've had in the past about uh, sort of large, unwieldy collaboration structures. That's, that's kind of the goal. Okay, I think that's all we have, Tony. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.